Hello, it's Scott Manley here. A couple of days ago, I made a video about the asteroid 2024 YR4, which is a small chance of hitting the Earth in 2032. And a lot of you have a lot of questions about that. And since then, I've actually gone and you know, worked out a mission plan to save the Earth. Well, that is perhaps overstating things somewhat, because this is only the size of a large nuclear weapon. It's not going to end the Earth. It's just going to make some people's days terrible or great if you're really interested in asteroids. Now, of course, a bunch of you had your minds stuck uh, squarely in the 1990s and immediately asked whether it was easier to train an astronaut to drill for oil or to train oil drillers to be astronauts. Well, I'm going to point out that NASA is well ahead of you in this one because in 2022, they selected astronaut Denise Burnham, who is uh, who's actually ran oil rigs and therefore qual is qualified. Another question a bunch of you asked is about this impact hazard map. All right, this is where the asteroid would fall if it hit the Earth. And many of you are confused. It's like, if we don't know it's going to hit the Earth, how do we know it's going to fall in this narrow strip of land? And the answer to this is we have a really good determination of the orbit in three-dimensional space, but we have a lot of fuzziness in the time. We don't know where it will be eight years from now to within, you know, a few hours. So if it gets to this point at the right time, then it'll hit the Earth. But if it arrives early, it misses. If it arrives late, it misses. But it passes through this exact same path on all these different versions. And you can imagine this as like a line slicing through the Earth, like a piece of cosmic cheese wire. And that red line is the path that it creates. So the next question is then, what are the effects you would see if you were like right underneath this thing? Well, we don't actually have an asteroid impact simulator, but we do have a nuclear weapon simulator here. And so Lagos, that's a pretty well-known city that just happens to lie pretty close to the impact point. We put a 40 megaton surface blast on it. And yeah, that's uh, quite a big bad area. So if you look along the side, this will give you some rough uh, estimates of the amount of damage. Now, obviously things like the radiation radius don't actually make any sense, but the thermal radiation, that totally makes sense. So as this 40 to 90 meter piece of cosmic debris comes through the atmosphere, it's going to light up like the sun and you'll create thermal radiation, which is enough to burn people on the ground. So if humanity is extraordinarily unlucky, we could find ourselves with an object hitting a city of 21 million people. And if you look over eastern India, then you have Calcutta, which of is like a city of like 5 million people. That could be there if we're extraordinarily unlucky. Of course, most of the impact sites are on the ocean or on more sparsely populated areas of the planet. So the next question is, when would we know whether it was going to hit or miss? And based upon the rate uh, at which the residuals and the errors are coming down, we may not know until 2028 because it's heading out into deep space and the errors are not coming down quickly enough unless we get something that really constrains it. If, we, if it passes in front of a star and we are able to capture that, or if we get an old pre-covery image from like 2020, that would change the game. But it's entirely likely that we could see it disappearing off into deep space, no longer able to see it, and still not know for sure whether it is going to hit or miss the Earth. And then four years later, it'll come back. And in the middle of 2028, it'll finally be bright enough for us to start seeing it. And as soon as we see it for the first time, we will almost certainly know whether it will be an impactor or not. And if that's the case, we'll have much more time to plan observations that could potentially figure out exactly where it will hit. We may be able to use planetary radar, we may be able to use occultation data, but by the time by the time it heads back into deep space, we will probably know where exactly it was going to hit. And that would give us a few years to evacuate the area, move people out, and of course set up for the massive amount of science we would expect from this glorious, oh, sorry, disastrous event. Sorry, was that the asteroid scientist speaking? But as I said, the DART mission has proven that humanity now has the means to control its own destiny with regards to small solar system bodies. We are able to change the universe so that the Earth is no longer threatened by these things. Now, it's not the only way, right? So DART is a kinetic impactor that hits into the object and you know, slows the thing down and changes its orbit. 
But there are other potential options people uh, have discussed. First of all, you can just, just simply change the color. You could paint it a different color. That's one possibility, and it would actually change the orbit by about an hour every four years, which is enough. Uh, you could attach a spacecraft to it with rocket engines and push it, right? You could fly another spacecraft up next to it and then just have it fly alongside and use the spacecraft's gravity to pull it out of orbit. That is called a gravity tractor. You could use solar sails. None of these things are going to work for this. And the main reason is that it flies past the Earth at 13 and a half kilometers per second and it takes way too much fuel and energy or time to actually rendezvous and slow down next to this. Instead, we're left with, if we just you know, stand in front of it as it flies past, it'll slam into it at 13.5 kilometers per second, and there will be a significant amount of momentum transfer. So that's great. We know how to do that. We've demonstrated it with DART. The next question is, how big a spacecraft do we need to hit it with? Well, I did the math in a tweet. Like, this is how easy it was. I literally figured out, well, you know, we need to have... 0.16 or sorry 1.6 millimeters per second delta v change and given that it's flying past at 13.5 meters uh, kilometers per second and depending upon the size of the object we'd need an impact or anywhere from 40 kilograms to 1.6 tons that's how easy it is to figure this out now the heavier the spacecraft the bigger the push we can give it but equally the heavier the spacecraft the more likely we are to potentially break up the target into chunks which could come down in different places and that is definitely a concern we really don't know very much about this asteroid right now we just have a very rough idea about its size and we may get a better idea in 2028 so now the question is if you had this spacecraft ready to go, would you have to launch it years in advance or could we wait until we know for sure that it is needed? So can we launch it, say, after July of 2028 and have it get to the target in time to make the orbit change? So we can use NASA tools to actually plan for a potential intercept mission. And this is a mission which is basically going to send a spacecraft, you know, to interact with the object. We're not going to rendezvous, we're just going to fly into it. Now, JPL has a whole bunch of different tools, and this is the small body mission design tool. And you can see I put in the asteroid here, and it's already got a whole bunch of data. And what it's actually done is it's already prepared a bunch of potential missions to the object. Now, I'm just going to sort this by year, because we're thinking that we're not going to know that it's going to hit the Earth until 2028 or sometime in 2028 it'll come to a position where we've got the data we'll know for sure we know whether we need to launch or not so yeah click through here we go 2028 we can launch in May 9th right and uh, the what you've got here is the time of flight will be 225 days uh, it'll arrive on 20th of December the C3, this is an important one, this is the amount of energy it takes to throw the spacecraft off into deep space. The lower this is, the less rocket power you need, the heavier your spacecraft can be. 0 0.01 is pretty darn low, that's barely getting into deep space. They just push it over the edge and it sort of floats out there for a few months and then finally encounters the asteroid at a speed of 13.4 kilometers per second. And that's important for calculating the like the actual impact speed. Now, other interesting things is uh, the Sun-Earth you know, probe um, angle. What this is, this is the angle between the Sun, the Earth, and the probe. And if this is, say, smaller than 90 degrees, it means it's getting in towards the Sun, and it might be hard to observe. That is potentially something you want to do. If you want to you know, have telescopes pointed at the thing, you would like them, more things to be able to see this. So having it um, close to 180 is better. Also, Earth distance, 0.056. So that is based. So these two things are controlled upon, are based upon when the impact actually happens. So there's another one down about here, um, which you see time of flight ten days, and that launches on the fifth of December. It arrives ten days later, but this C three value is ninety three, which means you pretty much need to expend an entire Falcon Heavy to throw this spacecraft out there. So it's much harder to get to. 
Um, this arrives with pretty much... Well, actually, this is interesting because it arrives much faster. You see, this actually adds velocity to the, <laughs> the encounter velocity, but it's a pretty insane way of doing things. And uh, the Sun-Earth probe angle is even smaller because it's even closer to the Sun, so it's much harder to observe. Now, these are the predefined missions that were sort of derived using, I don't know, their mission criteria stuff. You'll see this one here, uh, 1170 days. That's way too long. We need something shorter so we can go down to interactive mission selection. And so let's just fix this number. V infinity will be about 15. So this is the, inf the velocity at which we arrive at the target. We want to start in 2028. There we go. And we're going to set a time of flight limit of 300 days because we need to get it to impact the target relatively quickly. We're only really interested from 2028 to 2029, so let's do that. And uh, then we'll update the figure. And so we have get this figure here, and this is what we call a pork chop plot. This It creates these weird patterns that look a bit like cuts of meat. I don't know if you see this. The idea here is up one axis you have the time of flight and then the bottom axis you have the earth departure date. And these contours on this one, the green ones, show the amount of velocity you need to send the object away with. So green is good, blue is bad, and white is just crazy. It's like above 150 kilometers per second square. So that's not going to happen. These numbers here also show you the impact velocity. Um, so yeah, you can see the impact velocity actually gets lower depending upon how we throw things off. But yeah, this is the one that we had where we launch in May. You'll see and it arrives on 1226 and that has very low departure velocity. Down here, this is the one where we throw it out at the last minute and it hits the target. Um, but we could choose objects in this area here. So you'll see that the C3 departure is very low on this and it arrives on 1216. Well, remember, we said it would be nice if we could actually observe the object. And so maybe we should delay it, right? So 1226, that's better. That means it arrives in a position where we're going to have a much better view of the target. Or we could even go out to like 10.5. But yeah, if we launch here, then the C3 for departure is only... 1.96 kilometers per, per second. That's pretty good. So that's good. And then, you know, maybe we add in some contingency windows, you know, departure windows later. So this is in September and this is in October. And you'll see that we're slowly increasing the C3 requirement, but these are all pretty doable, right? So there's a whole range of launch opportunities that gets us to the asteroid just after Christmas. And if I scroll back up now, and look on page two, we've now added these different options and you'll see these slowly increasing C3s, but also we'll see the Sun-Earth planet angle is bigger. So we are able to get a better view of this if we are wanting to study the impact from the Earth. And I can actually select these like this and plot their trajectories. And sure enough, it shows like, this is where we depart on this trajectory and it comes around and hits the asteroid here, and there's another one a little later that comes around and arrives there. So these things are very low departure velocity, therefore they don't need anything bigger than a Falcon 9 for something that is as big as three tons, which is more than what we need to change the course on this object. We have lots of opportunities, but the other thing to realize is these departure times, August, September, October, they are all well after the, we should be able to get observations of the target of the object on the way in. So we could launch the, the spacecraft knowing whether it's needed or not, or rather we could see this, the asteroid come in and say, okay, it's not going to hit, we don't need to launch this anymore. Also, given that the mass of the asteroid is one of the big unknowns that we could constrain better in 2028, uh, you could launch the spacecraft with most of the mass being basically in a propellant tank. And then if you realize the asteroid is a little smaller and you don't want to hit it so hard, you could actually just dump some of that propellant out prior to the final impact so that, you know, you tune your uh, orbit based upon this. 
So if the human race wanted to do this, we have the technology, we know how to do it, we've done it before. The launch vehicle is nothing special. The launch windows, the timings all line up. One question is, who would do it? Now, obviously, the original DART mission was NASA, but this is much more in the realm of, you know, Space Force, right? Planetary Defense, literally the Department of Defense. But then again, none of the areas underneath the track are particularly important to the US. Would there be the willpower to actually build a spacecraft which may or may not be needed four years from now? Furthermore, if somebody did hit it and it broke up and suddenly they would be the ones that were liable for all the fragments falling down in different places. So while this is something that humanity could absolutely do, I'm not sure it's going to happen because we'd have to start right away and immediately there would be people questioning about spending money on this when it could be spent on something else. And so realistically, we're back to hoping it doesn't hit the Earth. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.